One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. This is the Kalam cosmological argument. This argument began its journey in the hands of medieval Islamic scholars who held that faith was enough for a belief in God, but still sought a logical basis for that belief. They attempted to establish a beginning of the universe and God as the creator at that beginning. For years, it has taken a back seat to other forms of the cosmological argument, especially those established by Aquinas. However, in the 20th century, the Kalam cosmological argument was revived by the philosopher William Lane Craig. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists instead of just nothing? The Kalam cosmological argument, as supported by William Lane Craig, has two truth claims, what philosophers call premises, tied together to form a conclusion. The first truth claim or premise is whatever begins to exist has a cause. The second premise is the universe began to exist. And if we say that whatever begins to exist has a cause and the universe is something that began to exist, then we draw the logical conclusion that the universe has a cause. To find out more and to search for justifications for the truth claims in the Kalam cosmological argument, I talk to philosopher and author Peter S. Williams. Premise one, just to, to recap, um, which says that uh, anything that has a beginning must have a cause of some kind. Okay. Um, I think defenders like Craig um, put a lot of emphasis on, on, on saying that they, they think that that premise is just simply intuitively quite obvious that they think uh, that premise is more plausible than its denial and that the burden of, of, of proof, as it were, is really on the person who doubts that premise um, to show that it's, it's not true or implausible rather than on the person who's advancing that premise to kind of prove to us that it's true just because it seems so intuitively obvious. In philosophy, we talk a lot about burden of proof. Often, when confronted with a claim that may or may not be true, we have to establish whose burden it is to prove it one way or the other. Take the example of me, clearly remembering having eaten lunch. Now, this seems so obvious to me that someone who believes I didn't eat lunch would have to prove that I didn't, rather than me trying to prove that I did. The burden of proof would be on the other to disprove my claim in this instance, and the presumption of truth lies with me. Peter is applying this kind of principle to causation. He's saying that if something just popped into existence, we would automatically assume that it had a cause of some kind. For instance, we're sat in a room with a projector and a film starts to play. This film has popped into existence in the, in the sense that a minute ago this particular showing had not started, it did not yet exist. And it seems intuitively obvious that a projectionist caused the film to start it. It had a cause of some kind. And the burden of proof would be on someone who disagrees with that. The same, Peter argues, can be applied to the universe beginning to exist that it seems intuitively obvious that that had a cause, and the burden of proof would be with someone who disagrees. Well-known atheists um, support, um, seem to support that kind of premise. Um, David Hume, well-known um, Scottish sceptical philosopher, uh, once said that uh, he had never um, supported so absurd an idea as that something could arise without a cause, that something could just pop into existence, as it were, uh, and there'd be no explanation, no reason um, for it uh, arising, for it popping into existence. Um, so it's not just an intuition um, shared by people who believe in a god, or believe in a cause of the universe, it seems to be a, an intuition um, that's shared by people on both sides of the debate, one might argue. 
So there's the classical defense given to premise one, the truth claim that whatever begins to exist has a cause. The second premise is the universe began to exist. What's the justification for that premise? We'll cover the scientific reasons why we now believe the universe had a cause in a separate lesson. Here we're focusing on the philosophical arguments. Philosophically, arguments uh, range around the idea of whether it's possible to have uh, an infinite regress of causes or an actual infinite set of, say, past events. Because if it's not possible to have an, an actually infinite set of past events, then the set of past events can't be actually infinite. It must instead be finite. And there must have been a, a first event. To grasp this concept, we must understand the concept of an actual infinite. An, an actual, actual infinite, infinite is a set of numbers or events that has no beginning and no end. If we, if we add more to the set, set it, is it is still infinite. infinite. If it, it takes away, away, it is still, still infinite. infinite. An, an actual, actual infinite, infinite has, has no beginning, beginning and no end. Now, most people have heard of infinites. But what we refer to as infinites in everyday language is not actual infinites, a set of numbers with no beginning and no end, but potential infinites. A potential infinite has a beginning. It is never actually infinitely long. Numbers just keep on being added to it, but it can never reach actual infinity. However, our question is, are actual infinites possible? If it is possible to have an actual infinite, then it's possible to have a universe with no beginning and no end. If it's not possible to have an actual infinite, then the universe must necessarily have a beginning. So, is it possible to have an actual infinite? Imagine a library with an actually infinite number of books. There are so many books you can't count them all because there are always more to count. There's no beginning and no end to the number of books. The number of books is actually infinite. Now suppose that we take every other book away. With a normal, non-infinite number of books, you'll have just halved the amount. But not with this library. Because this library has an actually infinite number of books, taking half away still leaves an actually infinite number. And the number of all those you've just tossed out, that is, every other book, is also actually infinitely long. So, dividing an actual infinite into two doesn't create two halves of an actual infinite. It creates two actual infinites. And that is clearly not possible. Let me give you another example. Suppose one of the books in this library is actually infinitely long and say I start reading it and I get through 20 pages. Now with a normal book you'd have thought I'd be making progress but not when I'm reading a book that's actually infinitely long. I've still got an actually infinite number of pages to go. I can't move through the book. Even if I read page after page, I'm nowhere nearer the end. Even if I read for days and days, I've still got an actually infinite number of pages to go before I reach the end. And that is clearly not possible. These kind of practical problems show that actual infinites are impossible. Philosophers discard actual infinites because they just don't make sense. As Peter Williams says... Just ludicrous. It just um, uh, shows the, uh, the impossibility of an actual infinite set of things existing in concrete reality. Therefore, because actual infinites cannot exist, the universe cannot be infinitely old, and thus must have had a beginning. So, there were some popular defences of both premises in the Kalam cosmological argument. But next we must ask, is the argument logically valid? Is it a proof? If so, what kind? To remind ourselves of the argument again, we have premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. 
Premise two, the universe began to exist. And from that, we draw the conclusion that the universe had a cause. This kind of argument is called a deductive argument. This means that if it is logically valid and its premises are true, then its conclusion must be true. The Kalam cosmological argument has a particular form. Arguments are like machines. If we replace their words with symbols, we can watch their cogs turning. So now, premise one, which was, everything that begins to exist has a cause, now reads, all A's have a C. And premise two, which was, the universe began to exist, now reads, the U is an A. And if all A's have a C, and the U is an A, it follows that the U must have a C. The two premises, that if U is an A, and all A's have a C, then U must have a C. This is called a deductive proof. But some philosophers still find problems with its conclusion. They may question, for instance, who made this first cause? Who made this God? The famous atheist professor Lewis Wolpert gives this objection in a debate with William Lane Craig. Because I think when one comes to the existence of God, you have to ask once again who created God. You see, if you're going to go for causal effects, so there's a God, then you have to say, but sorry, where did God come from? It's not a question I hear often answered. God, where did you come from? Not even God answers that. And who created God? Well, this is not at all difficult to answer. A timeless, eternal being cannot have a cause. As Keith Ward points out in his book, God, Chance, and Necessity, if one asks what caused God, the answer is that nothing could bring into being a reality which wholly transcends space-time and which is self-existent. To fail to grasp such an idea is to fail to grasp what God is. Moreover, I have given an argument that there exists such a being, namely my first argument based upon the beginning of the universe. It leads us to the postulation of a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and uncaused eternal being. To ask who caused God is, in this context, to ask who caused the uncaused conclusion of the Kalam cosmological argument. This question simply doesn't make sense. It assumes the conclusion of the Kalam argument to be false. This commits the fallacy called begging the question. This is where you assume the conclusion in your argument. So this objection is illogical, it is fallacious, and Craig's original argument still stands. However, Wolpert's objection does show us that the Kalam cosmological argument has been a popularly debated and much contested philosophical issue. This is because it's so simple, containing only 18 words, but making such dramatic claims. With its origins in the ancient world and its resurgence at the hands of William Lane Craig, the Kalam cosmological argument has moved the minds of many high-level philosophers and scientists. Its ancient, basic and compelling form still takes the foreground in many contemporary debates. It offers us a truly dramatic answer to one of our most basic questions. It tells us that we did not just happen, but that we are caused. And whatever we may think of this cause, the Kalam cosmological argument forces us to consider the possibility of its reality. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. <laughs>